This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. How did Menace Society even come about? Well, it was interesting. It was like my brother and I had an idea at you know, 15 that we wanted to do this kind of hood story. But our, our perspective is we wanted to, you know, have it be told from the point of view of this, this kid that just got corrupted by, you know, nature versus na- nurture. And he got corrupted by both, basically, right? Um, at the time that we, we got to the age where we we're about to start doing music videos, um, we were at a production company that we were assigned to called Underdog Film, which was a black-owned film company in L.A., and they were doing a music video for the Boys in the Hood soundtrack. We had saw the Boys in the Hood trailer, and we're like, uh-oh, it's over. Somebody already beat us to it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we were in the production company at the time. They, you know, they'd insert the clips into the music videos from the movie back mm-hmm. then, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and and we, they had two three-quarter-inch tapes. You know, the movie was split in two. And this closet room with a, with a TV and a playback thing. And we decided after work one day, let's just go watch this thing to see where we're before we give up on our dream, you know? So we watch it and halfway through, we're just looking at each other going, this is really spoon fed, you know, this is kind of, it's weak uh, compared to what we want to do, like uh, stylistically and thematically, it's, it's, it's not as potent as what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the same time, we had saw James Almost American Me, which mm-hmm. blew our minds. Yes. And that actually made, that actually made Menace to Society a harder movie. Cause we saw that, we're like, oh shit, we got to, we got to at least be where, where, where that movie is. So my brother took the lead in, in, in developing the script while we were 18 doing these music videos. And he would show me like 10 pages or 20 pages, you know, from our friend Tiger Williams. And at the time it was called Rampage, right? The script was called Rampage. Nice. And there was no liquor, liquor store opening. There was no videotape that was going throughout the movie. And at the time, I started experimenting with, with marijuana. You know, we were late to marijuana, like mm-hmm. we were 18 or 19. And I, again, I was really introverted, shy, and socially awkward. So um, I, I, I started reading the script as the more and more pages came in. And then I was smoking one night, went to my room, and I came back to my brother and Tiger. I said, we need to have an opening scene that knocks people's socks off. Like, they need to know when they see this opening scene, the rest of the movie, this is what you're in for, basically, right? And so I pitched them the opening scene, not knowing that that would be a through line throughout the the script, because that was the last thing we added, you know, before the script was complete. Now, once we completed the script, we had two line producer friends from music videos. One guy was Ruben Mendoza. The other guy was Darren, um, who's our, who ended up being the producer. I forget his last name now. Um, Darren Scott, Mm -hmm. um, who produced one of our Tupac videos. Okay. So we hand them both, my brother hands them both the script and says, whoever can get it set up, you could be the producer, you know, naively, thinking that that's how producing works. It doesn't. Um, we get an agent um, who then moves to CAA. We still haven't done anything yet except for a few music videos. And um, uh, she says, you know, New Line read your script, but they don't want to do that. I want you to go in and meet with them. They want to talk to you about Last Dragon Part Two. So on the way over to New Line, on our first meeting with an executive, uh, my brother pulls up the car to a parking meter and he says, listen, fuck that. We're not doing Last Dragon Part 2. We're going to go up there and pitch, re-pitch Menace. So we go into the office and do just that. Not knowing that uh, an East Coast uh, exec had read the script and loved it, which put pressure on the West Coast rep, uh, exec, right? And um, Bob Shea, who was the owner and founder of New Line, um, found out about the script People were excited about it, and, and the wheels were starting to roll. Mm-hmm. And they, he wanted he wanted to re, put the script on Weekend Read. And I think it was a Thursday or Friday we got a call that, you know, um, Bob Shea and everybody's going to read it this weekend. But he hears you guys did an episode of America's Most Wanted. And he saw all your music videos, but he wants to see that episode of America's Most Wanted. And we're like, fuck, our career is already over. Because <laughs> we did this episode, and it was horribly acted you know, some janky direction. And it was something that me and my friends, we would all just clown and we'd say lines from it. Like it was, it, 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 you know, it was, it was, we spooked it. It was so bad, right? Right, right. We would just clown it daily and we buried it deep inside our like conscious, like ugh, whatever. 
now Bob Shea wants to see this. Like we're at the kind of apex of us maybe making it in this business. I'm like it's over. Mm -hmm. So come Monday, uh, we said he read it and he cried, and he he wants to make the movie. And he obviously already saw the Miracles Most Wanted. So we got over that hump, and that's how, that's how it started. That's awesome. And then I know I know from my research, I found out that you guys were going to have Tupac in it at one point, right? And then it kind of he, yeah, he was he was actually casting it. He was actually casting it. And then it kind of and it kind and of fell was, apart. Yeah, he he was disruptive in in casting. No, excuse me, um, rehearsal. And my brother had had you know a few confrontations over it. And you know, um, you know this is before. You know the thing about Tupac to be fair is that he he never he was never threatening when he was by himself. You know he was a buck fifty. We were about two hundred at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And you know contrary to popular you know, opinion of, of what happened between us. He buried a hatchet with us, you know, shortly before he died. Um, but it never, there would have never, there was never a beat down by him or nothing like that. It was 15 guys, you know? Right. Um, but my brother, my brother was ballsy with him. My brother stood up to him and, and, you know, at a certain point when he confronted him, he said, uh, you know, it looks like you, you want to knuckle up. And my brother always gets this smile on his face when he knows something's about to go down. And my brother has also confronted each and every one of our bullies in childhood at, at one point or another. He just stands up to him. So let's go. Right. So he saw some bullying going down and he, he just was like, oh, you, you're trying to knuckle up. And my brother stood up and Tupac's like, nah, call my manager. So my brother called his manager and said, I don't know what to do. You know, he's being very disruptive. We think part of the reason he was disruptive is because he wasn't in a starring role at the time, and he just come off with Juice, and he was doing John Sing. He finished John Singleton's uh, Poetic Justice, and he just wasn't happy with the role that he accepted that he was supposed to do, which was uh, the Muslim role, which was a, mm -hmm. a very small role. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, Bob Shea and New Line had told us that you know we need platinum rappers in the, the movie. Tupac wasn't necessarily a platinum rapper at the time, but we had Too Short and other people in, in the movie. So we were scared of, of losing a movie if we had a problem with Tupac in one way. But my brother knew that it was like a situation that couldn't be resolved because he was so disruptive, partially because he didn't know his lines, partially because he wanted all the attention on himself, um, which a true star, that's how they are. And he, <laughs> he's a true star. I can't deny that. Um, so my brother had to go tell Bob Shea at a Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross premiere. Wow. He, he goes yeah. to his premiere. Bob, we, we, we got a problem. And he tells him, and Bob says, fire him. And my brother's like, really? Can, will you allow us to do that? He said, yeah. My brother called up the manager. Yo, it's over. We got, a, we, got a, we got a movie to make. We can't be fucking around with this shit, right? It broke on MTV News, and, you know, it just became this wild story. But it, it, there wasn't, it, was, it wasn't anything we would, we would have done differently. I, the way my brother handled it, because, again, he was more the producer social type back mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. He he couldn't have handled it better, you know. Um, the the way Tupac responded to it was was not a good thing, you know. Um, and and we to this day if we make a project and we see something disruptive, you know, it's one thing I always tell young filmmakers is like, don't let the cancer grow. Whether mm -hmm. it's a crew member, whether it's a cast member, amen. Whether it's you, you know, if you let that cancer grow, it, it will fester and you infect. know it will, it will it will permeate everything. It will affect yeah. infect everything, kill it in the crib. No, without question. And it could be something as simple as a first AD, uh, a camera yep. op, um, yep. and, and all the way to the like lower, even I've even had mute, I have had sound guys who just had such yep. a bad well, attitude. You man, know, I've had that. I've had, I've, I've had operators. I've yeah. Had, well, when I was younger, I didn't know how to deal with it. Like me and my brother both, he was more vocal, but we, we would both bury it and basically let it fester. And then it would explode in a different way that's not healthy, you know? Right. And as I older, I, I will, and you know, you learn how to be a leader of 150 people, you know? If, if you're paying attention, you learn how to be better at that, right? And, and what I've learned is like, you, you got a ball, you know, grow a pair of balls or fallopian tubes, whichever, <laughs> and go corner that person, just go, yo, what's up? Because if you, if you fuck around, you're gone. Yeah. Um, and then you know, the person, you know, if they're real dicks, they're gonna keep acting up, and then you gotta make an example out of them. I had a first AD, man. Day one, he was older than me. Obviously, a frustrated director started giving me crap, and I was paying him. I was the my production company was doing the TV show, and he, and I'm like, after day one, I'm like, dude, I, I'll do this without you. 
Like I can, I can run my own set. I don't need you. And uh, th after that, well, was... you were talking about something too. The age thing is something we ran into a lot. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, of you course, because you were like, especially back then. Like nowadays, it's a, even a little bit more accepted because now everyone, like you know, if you're 20 something, you could be directing Black Panther. <laughs> you know, or, yeah. or or something like that. Where back in the night, that old school mentality, man, it was if you had a forty five year old or fifty year old, and had twenty two, and I'm working for a twenty one year old <laughs> director. Oh man! Oh yeah. A, I mean, we, we 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 there would be several occasions where we walk on the set and the grips would go, "Here, kid, put that sandbag over there," <laughs> not knowing we were the director, yeah. right? And then at lunch, you're like, we're, "We're so sorry." We said, "We're like, man, whatever." We I mean, we look like young punks, you know. <laughs> Um, I mean, even on that movie, there, there were actors talking shit to us in our first movie. Like, this movie ain't shit. It ain't going to be shit. You guys aren't shit. Like, we're like, fuck. Yeah, this is rough. I just want to tell stories. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is rough. But the one thing we had was each other. You yeah, know, man. If, that if must be was, awesome. If it was just one of us and you're getting picked at like that and you don't have a partner to say, you know, compare notes, it, it would have been rough. You know, and my brother was a really great fullback, you mm -hmm. know, for me, you know, because um, I was quite sensitive and, you know, inward and all that other stuff, you know, and it took me a while to grow into expressing myself and learning how to lead a crew and, and, and doing the right thing, you know. And, you know, we also don't like screamers and yellers and oh, tension. You know? Yeah. We, we just don't we don't deal with that, you know. Um, you know, we've had our little outbursts every once in a while, but we'll, we're usually going against other dickheads, you mm -hmm. know. Like, if, if there's a dickhead, we can pull our dickhead card out, too, you know. <laughs> and we also learned, we learned about ego in this business, too, which is, right. you know, you hear stories about, like, directors having an ego or, or, or an actor having an ego, and then you may meet that person that the story's out about, and you're like, oh, this, actually, this person's actually a cool motherfucker, right? Um, he's not the traditional horror story that you, you've heard about. And then we realize that that person probably used their ego to suppress another ego. So the horror story about them was about suppressing another ego that was out of control, right? Which you, you have to do sometimes. Like, and I think that's the only time it's healthy to, in a, in a collaborative sense, use your ego. Is, uh, you know, mine only comes out when I feel like somebody's acting out and their talent level is not at the same level as their ego. You know, the, right. the scales of... Of talent justice is a way off balance. And I'm like, well, this motherfucker right here needs to get verbally smacked, you know? And then my <laughs> ego comes out. I was like, why are you wasting my time, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a healthy way to use it, you know? Um, uh, I don't know. They're just all these little tricks you learn, you know, mm -hmm. with, with people and groups and, you know, group, group think too. It's like, you know, a, a production is like an organism and it, it, it thinks in this one way, right? And it doesn't matter if you're Tom Cruise or Tom Hanks. If they hate you, they hate you. Oh, yeah. And they're not going to go, they're not going to bend over backwards for you and go an extra hour for you. If they, if they as a group think, don't like you, you're done. Yeah, just ask George Lucas on the, on the original Star Wars. Like, they, they're like, nope, it's tea time. We, I don't care about your damn big gorilla thing oh, over there. They, and they always, every, <laughs> all, the American filmmakers are always quick to talk shit about the British. Yeah, those are some of the hardest motherfuckers on the planet. Mm -hmm. Give them their tea time. They, they, the one thing they don't do those Brits is they don't come to you pushing scripts on you and shit like that. They're like, "Well, you want the camera, camera gov?" You know, and and they, they're they're specialists <laughs> at their job and they take pride in you know the grip is going to be a grip, the operator is going to be an operator, right? They don't have ambition delusions of ambitions beyond uh, you know they're just they're professionals. Oh, so you, in other words, the, the so you you mean to tell me that occasionally the grip will bust out a script and go, "Hey, Albert, listen, man." I know I'm here just gripping, but oh, I got the, Oh, you know the American one. The American one, yeah. of course. <laughs> it's like that great movie, Living in Oblivion, where the where the DP is always walking around with a script in his back pocket trying to trying to cast the the, the star of this little independent or the, film. Or the or the I mean the difference between an American actor and a British actor too is an American actor will come up to you and say, you know, it might be a bit player. He might just go or she may go, you know, I'm standing here on the street corner and I'm looking at that, that <laughs> window over there i think i think you should get a shot of the window and then turn around and get a close-up on me and i'm sitting there mm -hmm, mm -hmm, all right and just walk away right a british actor would never do that interesting they they know their lane you know it's one thing to be collaborative and like you know my character i think needs this or sure, you know sure. whatever right you're telling me which way to put my camera yeah you know, we got a problem 
And you know, do you trust me? I I know that. But isn't it isn't it funny that everything we're just talking about this is not a chapter in in film school. Like this is not something that's talked about ever about the politics. It should be a course called the politics of the set. Oh, yeah.